continue our study on um, the shield of faith and um, we want to look at Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10. In that passage of scripture you know that the apostle Paul was imprisoned and he had a lot of time to live with Roman soldiers. So his mind and his imagery and his metaphor of life was influenced by their uniform. So in writing the church at Ephesus, he says, finally, my brethren, here it is. After all I've said to you about marriage and family, after all I've said to you about unity in the body, after all I've said to you about your responsibility to those in government, the relationship between parents and children, between you and civil authority, after I've said all these things to you, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, nor against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Last week we began looking at this passage of scripture where the apostle Paul clearly states that we are engaged in spiritual warfare. However, we have learned that God has equipped us with weaponry which enables us to stand against the wiles of the devil against principalities against powers against the rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places to even withstand in the evil day but we must stand taking onto us the whole armor of god we learned that we will always be victorious through him we also learned that several things result from allowing God to fight the battle. The soldier does not have to fight the battle. When the battle is over, all the enemies are defeated. You get a none shall escape victory. All the spoils of war belongs to the soldier undivided. And the return trip is marked with singing and praising. You get a reason to rejoice. And God provides rest. All of these things are the results when we allow God to fight our battle rather than we try to fight it ourselves. However, to gain the victory, we have to fulfill the requirements of God. We must appropriate the whole armor of God. The belt, truthfulness, commitment, readiness, preparation has to be worn. The breastplate, righteousness, holiness, correctness has to shield the heart. The shoes, the gospel of peace, confidence in God must be worn also. Yet, there is another valuable piece of armor that also must be worn and which is the focus of this series. The shield of faith. It is a very important aspect of the battle gear because it has the ability to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. It is both a weapon of defense as well as a weapon of offense. Because we indicated to you that not only was the shield four and a half feet high and shaped like a door, being able to shield the entire soldier, but it was also embossed on the outside with projections. So even as the soldier advances, it can also be a, a, a weapon that is offensive and not just defensive. The deadly darts of the enemy 
which faith quenches includes impurity selfishness doubt fear disappointment lust greed vanity the fiery darts of the enemy rain down on us continuously and today we are going to advance our warfare training by talking about the art of using the shield and making the final stand faith as a shield is essential why is faith the shield faith is a shield because it gives a connotation of belief in god it is the bottom line of our commitment scripture reminds us that faith is essential in our walk with god it is essential i indicated to you in the past that without it is impossible to please god i indicated to you that it's true faith we are saved is by grace we are saved through faith not of works lest any man should boast in habakkuk 2 4 it says behold his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him but the just shall live by faith so we must have faith to please god we must have faith to be saved and as justified saints of god we need faith to live so faith is essential in romans 1 17 that statement is repeated and the apostle paul says for daring is the righteousness of god revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith he was quoting habakkuk and then he says it again in galatians 3 11 in another way he says but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of god it is evident for the just shall live by faith so faith is an absolute essential in this christian warfare why because what you believe influences your attitude and your attitude influences your actions and responses and your actions and responses will result in consequences which impact the condition of your life and even the lives of those around you and who will follow you your legacy at the last supper jesus reminded peter that he had an active enemy who was out to get him in luke 22 31 to 32 and the lord said simon simon behold satan had desired to have you satan wants you what does he want to do with you he wants to sift you as wheat it's like he puts you in the fan and he throws you up in the air and let the wind blow as it wants it will separate the shaft from the kernel that's what satan wants to do he wants to split you apart he wants to turn you inside out he walks around as a as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour but jesus says simon in spite of all of that opposition in spite of all the intentions of the enemy i have prayed for you but what did jesus pray for did he pray that peter will never be tempted did he pray that peter will never be challenged did he pray that peter will never be persecuted no there is something that is more important to jesus than all of that and that is that your faith will not fail and he's prayed that when you are converted you will use your experience to strengthen the brethren now why did jesus pray that peter's faith does not fail i am persuaded that it is because faith enables us to stand against the attacks of the enemy this is not a physical fight so it cannot be won with physical weapons it cannot be won with more money it cannot be won with more social programs it cannot be won by a change of government faith is the victory that overcomes the world first john chapter 5 verse 4 says for whatsoever is born of god overcomes the world and this is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith this is the victory this is the victory our faith shambak used to say you don't have any trouble all you need is faith in god my sister used to say to us why worry 
when you can pray. Faith is a victory that overcomes the world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 5, the apostle Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Stop warring after the flesh. Stop fighting your battles in the flesh. It is not a spiritual warfare and your enemy is not physical. And in any case, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Carnal weapons are not strong enough to deal with this adversary who has been around for legions, for not legions, for millenniums. Carnal weapons will not do. We need weapons that are mighty. And the only weapons that are mighty enough to deal with this enemy is the weapons that are mighty through God. Not through physical means, not through pop psychology, but through God. And they're effective in pulling down strongholds. They're effective in casting down imaginations. They're effective in pulling down and casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I want you to note closely those words. Our thoughts, our knowledge, our imaginations have a strong hold on us. It is not that abusing husband. It is not that ruthless boss. It is not that annoying neighbor. It is your thoughts, knowledge, and imaginations that have a stronghold on you. And if those thoughts, knowledge, and imaginations are not shielded by faith, then there is an open opportunity for the enemy to subdue and to control you. So in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23, the apostle, the writer of Hebrews says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. For he is faithful. Everybody say he's faithful. That promised. You need to hold fast in that. You need to know that God is faithful. You elect governments every five years. Some promises are fulfilled and some are not. It may not be a lack of unfaithfulness. It may be an inability to do what you promised in the first place. It may be certain circumstances beyond the control. Unanticipated contingencies. It happens in our own lives. In our own relationships. But God is faithful. He is faithful. Hold fast without wavering to the fact that God is faithful. Who promised? And note Romans 8.28 where the apostle says, and we know. Everybody say, we know. Not we think, not we feel, not that we have an idea. It's not a citation or a reference. We know that all things work together for good. To them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. That's why I don't believe in luck. People who are not of faith believe in luck. They believe things happen by chance. I believe God is in control. It reminds me of a story that I read. A farmer had a very small farm with one, with one horse. And he was poor. He wasn't making much money. And his neighbor said, boy, you're real unlucky. You only have one horse. And then the horse got away. And the horse was lost. He said, boy, your luck gone worse. Bad things gone worse. Like you jinx. You real, really unlucky. But then the horse came back with several wild horses. So he never said, wow, you lucky. And then his one son, his only child who was with him, had been with the farm, trying to train one of the wild horses, was thrown off the back, and he broke his leg. And he must say, boy, you're real unlucky. And then after that, there were some bandits that came, looking to recruit young men into the gang. And they came to that farm to upset it and overturn it and to capture the young man but when he realized his foot was broken they leave him alone so you never say boy you're real lucky that your son forget me and that's how we respond to life we think it's luck or we think it's bad luck we are happy when things go the way we want it and we are sad when they don't happiness responds to events or happenings but not joy Joy is based on a deep down confidence that God is in control. A God who will work all things together for good. A God who knows the future. A God who holds the future. And a God who holds your hand. That is what faith is. 
And that's why faith is essential. Faith is essential. And faith as a shield helps you to stand. You know, God created the Garden of Eden. And then he placed Adam and Eve in the midst of its beauty and splendor. They were in euphoria. Everything was good. They didn't have to deal with recession. They didn't have to worry about shortages. They didn't have to worry about crowds of people storming supermarkets, long lines in banks, problems with foreign exchange. They didn't have to worry about the oil running out. They had a wealth of variety. They could have eaten whatever they want except from one tree. They were in charge of their environment. They had control of the animals. They named the animals. They dominated the earth. They had peace, unity, and harmony between themselves. Adam said, you are flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. Moses says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. Adam and God had a wonderful relationship. They walked and talked in the cool of the garden. It was beautiful. But then the devil came with his dart and fired a shot at Eve. And this is the shot in Genesis 3.1. Has God really said? Every dart of the devil introduces with his affirmation of believe me, not God. Every shot of the devil is targeted toward us doubting the integrity of God and his word. The darts are laced with questions that create doubt. And once doubt is introduced, the flesh has a great ability to justify the consumption of forbidden fruit. Rationalization becomes the order of the day. We're able to explain away our sins. Somebody says, when we deal with others, we are a judge. When we deal with ourselves, we are lawyers. We are always able to build up a defense, to justify our deeds. Adam, why are you hiding? Did you eat the fruit I told you not to eat? It's the woman you give me that make me do it. Justifying his actions. Always have a reason why your choice to do wrong is an exception to the norm. Validating your disobedience. Doubt and disbelief leads to disobedience. In Matthew chapter 4 and also in Luke chapter 4, we have an account of Satan sending his fiery darts in the direction of Jesus. The devil tempted his humanity. He was the son of man. The devil tempted the fleshly part of Jesus. The fleshly part of Jesus is just the robe that covered the Christ within. He's not Jesus Christ. He's Jesus who is the Christ. Christ is not his last name. Like I am Mark who is the pastor. Pastor is not my first name. I can't sign a check. Pastor Mark. I have to sign Mark David. Christ was his office. And he was robed. With Jesus. So Satan told his humanity. If you are the son of God. If you are the Christ Jesus. Why don't you satisfy the cravings of Jesus. Christ. <laughs> Look at you. 40 days hungry in the desert. Has your father forgotten you? Maybe it's time you start taking care of yourself. Maybe it's time you start handling this your way. Eat some bread. He has left you out here to starve alone. It's amazing the things we will do when we are alone. That's when our true character is tested. And the response of Jesus was founded in the word of God. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every time a soldier fails, he has brought a lie and doubted the truth of God's word. 
Don't buy the lies of Satan. Fornication, unequally yoked relationships. All these are evident examples. Lying, cheating. All these are evident examples of a man who has bought a lie. Or woman, or boy, or girl. The devil will say, try it, it is fun. Go ahead and do it. No one will ever know. No one will ever see you doing it. You're here all alone. Then the lie is bought and failure comes to fruition. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 10, the apostle John says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Will you believe God? Or will you make God a liar? And if you make God a liar, it's because you do not believe the record that God gave of his son. So the whole battle is an issue of faith. Are you seeing? In Titus chapter 1 verse 2, the apostle Paul says to Titus, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. Everything, everybody says God cannot lie. You see, some people say there is nothing that God cannot do. You have to say it this way. God can do anything that is consistent with his nature. So God cannot do anything that is inconsistent with his nature. The Bible says God cannot lie. So that is something that God is incapable of doing. You know why? Because he's God. And if something is not so, and he says it is so, it will be so, so it will be true. <laughs> so he cannot lie. If God says, this is a tree, and you say, this is a post, check again, it's a tree now, because God says so. Are you understanding the power of God? Because he's all powerful, he cannot lie. We could lie. Because we can say things and it doesn't necessarily mean that what we say is true. But God is truth. God is love. God cannot lie. So we have to know that if he says it, it's up to us to believe it. And that ought to settle it. Every time we sin. Every time we sin. And I challenge you to prove me wrong. Every time we sin is because we have believed a lie. You know why people break the speed limit? Because they believe they could drive safe at that speed and they believe they will get away with it. Am I wrong? Don't tell me anything about your hurry and your late. People just do it when they're not hurry and they're not late. So being hurry and late have nothing to do with driving spas. It has to do with your confidence in your ability to handle this at this speed and to get away with it. And once you believe that, you do it. it has nothing to do with what the law says. It has nothing to do with what the scientists and those who, who, who investigated and did surveys say. It has to do with what you believe. Your actions are based on your faith. And it's the same thing with sex. You believe that you can have premarital sex and once you don't get pregnant and you don't get HIV and nobody else knows, you get away with it. You can come to church and you put on a charade. I dare you to name me a sin that is a consequence of not believing a lie. That's why we need faith. That's why we need the girdle of truth. That's why we need the word of God. That's why we need the whole armor. But this morning I'm emphasizing the importance of faith. And what faith really is. So the devil says, God doesn't want you to be smart like him. If you disobey God, you will be like God. Knowing the difference between good and evil. But God already said... From before he made man, let us make man in our image and likeness. So Adam and Eve were already like God. 
And she had all these fruits she could have been eat, eating from. She wasn't hungry. She didn't have an issue of a lack of variety. She didn't have a dull, boring, monotonous life. Are you there? But God, why is it you don't want me to come home late? You don't realize I'm an adult. I safe. What you fussing for? Anybody know what you're talking about? Some people say real quiet because they're afraid their family do them so. You have your own ideas about yourself and you act in accordance with it. So the devil says, God don't want you to enjoy yourself. God don't want you to be happy. Just a list of do's and don'ts. A whole yoke of, 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 of a whole load of rules. Look how God forsake you. Look how you see in trouble. This Christian thing I'm working. From the time you start to come to church. Look your daughter gets sick. Look your car gets shut down. Look your Gary Trench. This church thing ain't working. God is a waste of time. It's best you go into the world and drink and walk and yourself. And while the devil is whispering all those lies in your head. Standing there on the other side. Even before the failure is accomplished. God is asking. If you ask me for bread. Will I give you a stone? God is asking. If you ask for a fish. Will I give you a snake? God is asking. Do I want to give you. Do I, don't, do I not want to give you. Press down. Shaking together. And running over. God is asking, do I want to give you, do I not want to give you every good and perfect gift that comes down from above? God is asking, do I, want, do I not want to give you above what you can even think or imagine? God is asking you, do I not want to share your burdens? After all the things that God has said through his word, the devil comes along and he says, do it my way. By my lie, the man who is not founded on a firm foundation succumbs and fails. He says, I believe the devil more than I believe God. And that is why faith as a shield helps us to stand. Faith as a shield ought to be the very lifestyle of a victor. Many people go through life seeking things. Things are supposed to bring peace and happiness. I tired of this old ragadaggy house. If I get a bigger house, I will be better. I tired of this big house. It's too much rooms to clean. If I get a maid, it will be better. I tired of this teething maid who doing halfway work. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. We feel things will buy us happiness. But I always tell you that what's the point of having the things that money could buy without the things that money cannot buy? Money could buy you the biggest mansion, but it cannot make the mansion a home. Money could buy you wardrobes of clothes, but it cannot buy you the health to wear the clothes. Money could buy you all sorts of nice, luxurious furniture, but it cannot give you the peace in the middle of the night. Because you're wondering who come into thief, or you're wondering who come in for you, because you thief. <laughs> so many people go through life seeking things. The things that are supposed to bring peace and happiness. And once all these things have been obtained, they find that they have missed out on the kingdom of God. Like the rich man who says, I've done so well. I'm going to build bigger bands. I'm going to stop for the future. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Fine. But tonight, your soul is required of you. And whose will all those things be that you amassed? You have to leave everything for somebody else. Thou fool. You've been rich in this world's goods. And you have not been rich towards God. 
Now, nothing is, being, nothing is wrong with being rich in this world's goods. Job was rich. Abraham was rich. Solomon was rich. But something is very wrong with not being rich towards God. So we need to soak our shield in the water of the word. I explained to you that the shield was covered with leather and they will soak it in water because the darts that the enemy sent, the tip of the dart was a ball of pitch. And when the pitch was lit, it would be a fiery dart. And when the fiery dart impacts with the shield, bits of burning pitch will fly all about. That's what a fiery dart is. It's not a puncture. It's not just a little poison dart, like some pygmy blowing at you. It's a fiery dart. It doesn't, when it impacts, it destroys what it impacts, and the danger splatters. But when the shield is soaked in water, it quenches the dart, so there is no splatter. So the shield doesn't only protect you, but it quenches the fiery dart. So your faith must be soaked in the water of the word. That's how you prepare for battle. You don't wait for the battle to then soak your shield. It will be too late. You don't wait for when the fiery dart come to look for water. Your shield must be already soaked. Prepare for warfare. Learn to wield your shield. The whole cha um, chapter of Psalms 119 praises and extols the greatness of the word of God. Proverbs 8.34 tells us that obedience brings the blessings. It said, blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. Obedience brings a blessing to the word of God. Our strength and hope lies in the word of God. In Jeremiah 13, 16, the word says, Thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. There are blessings that come even from just reading the word of God. Some of you say, well, Pastor Mark, I don't remember. I just enjoy your preaching, but when I finish, I can't remember what you say. Well, there is still benefit in even hearing. There was this young man who had a, bag, a basket of coals. And his mother told him to empty the coals. And he emptied it. So all the coal dust was all over the basket. And she says, go by the standpipe and fill the basket with water. And he carried the basket by the standpipe. And he poured water, he poured water, he poured water, he poured water. And the basket wouldn't hold water. So he brought back the basket and he said, Mom, it's a waste of time. This basket would not hold any water. She said, well, what about the coal dust? She said, he says, well, it's all washed off. So even if you can't hold the word, the word still has a cleansing effect. The psalmist David says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By giving heed to thy word, O God. So thy word, O God, have I hid in my heart that I will not sin against you. You see, water is not only for sustenance, where you drink it and you, and, you, and you get the nutrition from it on the inside. But water is also for cleansing. The word of God is also a cleansing agent. So there are blessings that come even from reading the word of God. In Revelation 1.3, the Apostle John has written, Blessed is he that read it, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. But not only that, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. You know the Bible is profitable for the perfection of the saints. The book of First Timothy says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. That a man of God may be made perfect, thoroughly furnished, unto all good works and in first john 1 4 it says and these things write me unto you 
that your joy may be full. So the Bible is profitable for the perfection of the saints. And it is written that the joy of the Lord may be ours. So we need to soak our shield in the word of God. The shield of faith is the steadfast application of what we believe about God in relation to the things we face in life. A couple of weeks ago, I shared that with you very graphically when we looked at Psalms chapter 27. You should probably get the tape. I can't remember what the name of the sermon is, but Brother Carr will help you. In life, we go through blessings and battles. And whether we survive, how we overcome, is impacted by what we believe about God and by our own attitude. So the psalmist says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I'm not even afraid of the dark. Because the Lord is my light and salvation. And goes on. I don't have to preach over that sermon because I'm preaching this one. So, your shield of faith is your steadfast application of what you believe about God in relation to the things that you face in life. The Bible says Abraham believed God. And he stood because of his faith. In Genesis 15, 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Proverbs 35 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. In Psalms 18, 13, 30, it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He's a buckler to all those that trust in him. Hebrews 84, 11, Psalms 84, 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. Soak your shield in the word of God. 1 John 5, 4 reminds us that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. 2 Corinthians 1, 24, it says, Not for that we have dominion over your faith. We as your spiritual leaders are not here to dominate your faith. We have a lot of talented, gifted people in this church. Some of them have external ministries. I don't dominate their faith. I don't restrict their mobility. No. Our job here is not to dominate your faith. Our job is to be helpers of your joy. But by faith you stand. See how important faith is? When our shield of faith is functioning appropriately, then we are made more than conquerors. Romans 8.37 says, Nay! In all these things, all these things that you're going through, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So the shield of faith ought to be the lifestyle of a victor. Will you be a victor or will you be vanquished? The shield of faith indeed quenches the deadly darts of the devil. Reverend Kelsey Griffin outlines several deadly deeds of the devil one is disappointment and you know why you're disappointed you're disappointed because you forget that romans 8 20 to 29 says and we know all things work together for good to them that love god to them who are called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We get discouraged because we forget. Disappointed, rather, because we forget. And sometimes our disappointment turns to discouragement. Like in 1 Samuel chapter 36, David was greatly distressed. For this people spake of stoning him. There was a crisis. And they blamed him for it. They felt that he was responsible. So he felt very distressed and discouraged. 
because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his own sons and for his daughters but david encouraged himself in the lord his god when we are discouraged we need to learn how to encourage ourselves in the lord and that's how the shield of faith works another deadly dart of the devil besides disappointment and discouragement is doubt which we spoke about before second corinthians 4 8 says we are troubled on every side yet not distressed we are perplexed but not in despair that is faith in the midst of doubt then there is disbelief you see when you when you allow the doubt to ding, linger it goes to disbelief and we spoke about that when satan in genesis 3 1 in the form of a serpent which was more subtle than any beast of the field which the lord god had made he said unto the woman yeah god said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden he is sowing seeds of disbelief first timothy 2 8 says i therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting when you stand here to pray pray with holy hands and without doubt that's the desire of the apostle paul another deadly dart is the dart of destruction that's what happened in genesis chapter 3 serpent said to the woman you will not surely die because she said to him god said even if you touch the fruit you will die he said no 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 you're not gonna die for god knows that in the day you eat thereof then your eyes will be opened and you shall be as gods knowing good from from evil distracting the woman another deadly dart is despair matthew 14 30 it says but when he saw the wind boisterous and i think sister somebody preached about peter i can't remember which one I'm not sure if it's sister Joyce Edwards. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And he began to sink. He cried saying, Lord, save me. And he was just walking on the water. Despair. What about double-mindedness? Matthew 6, 24. You know, Jesus says no man can serve two masters. You either will hate one and love the other or else you will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. If God be God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve him. Choose the day whom you will serve. You cannot serve two masters. That's double-mindedness. Ephesians 4, 16 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Double-mindedness. Some of us listen to all sorts of false doctrines and cause us to be double-minded. James 1.8 says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways and he shall not receive anything from the Lord. Double-mindedness is adverse to faith. When you pray, you must pray believing and faith believing. Not double-minded. <laughs> dishonesty is a dart of the devil second corinthians 4 2 says but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty we have renounced that have you renounced dishonesty not walking in craftiness some people too smart for their own good crafty no handling the word of god deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of god that's how the apostles work so we have dishonesty and of course with dishonesty there is the dart of deceit and there is also the dart of dullness for when you ought to be teachers you're still children when you ought to be eating meat you're still drinking milk and then there is deadness but we are supposed to be quickened we were supposed to be people who were dead in trespasses and sins in times past we walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience deadness deadness 
Shall we continue in sin that the grace of God may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Discord is another dart of the devil. You know, there are six things which the Lord hates. Yeah, there are seven things that are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. God hates that. Don't think it's only fornication and homosexuality is an abomination. Lying and slandering people and causing discord among the brethren is something that God also thinks is abominable. There is defilement. You know, I always like to tell you in 1 Corinthians 3, you know you're not that you are the temple of God, that the spirit of God dwells in you. If a man defile the temple of God, him God will destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And remember, you are not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are his. And do you know the devil is the king of defamation of character? He stands before God accusing the brethren. But God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have showed toward his name. In that you minister to the saints and you do minister. God will remember. God remembers if you receive a prophet. He's going to give you a prophet's reward. Even if you give that prophet a glass of cold water. I don't know why we keep saying yes. A glass of cold water. Disobedience. Is also. A dart of the devil. Remember Saul. How we disobeyed God. And he said God you know why we disobey you. Because we want to sacrifice. God said, destroy the Amalekites. Destroy everything. They serve the best of the bounty. And when the prophet comes and he says, did you do what God said? He said, yes, we won the battle. He said, but what mean at the bleating of the sheep? I hear behind the curtain. He said, oh, the people make me do it. Just like Adam. The people make me do it because we want to offer sacrifices to you. And then Samuel says, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. To hearken is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as the sin of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Some people want to be involved in ministry and they want to reject the word of God. They want to be involved in ministry in the name of God and refuse the counsel of God in their life. That's why in Romans 6.14 it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, you are under grace. Disobedience. All these are the darts of the devil. What deadly darts are the devil hurling at you this morning? In spite of how fierce or fiery the darts of the enemy may be against us. Let us wield our shield of faith. Remembering that the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And save it such as be of a contrite heart. The Lord is nigh unto them that call upon him. To all that call upon him in truth. Remember he says, I am the God. Am I a God at hand? Yes, he's a God at hand, said the Lord. He's not a God that is afar off. The psalmist says, it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Hebrews seven nineteen says, for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. How many of us are prepared to lift our shield of faith today? If you are prepared to do that, let's stand and draw near to him.